When the Great War ended in 1918, the German government was made to pay the Allies more money than they actually had in compensation for the destruction they had caused. Consequently, the people of Germany experienced unheard of levels of poverty, inflation and hunger. And the appalling conditions effectively paved the way for Adolf Hitler's National Socialist Party to gain control through the promise of a restoration of Germany's former might, prosperity and global influence. And once in power, Hitler's army wasted no time marching into and occupying several neighbouring countries. But when they invaded Poland in 1939, the British and French finally said enough was enough and the world was at war for the second time. In this war, Britain enlisted troops through conscription, so there was no need for a campaign to shame them into fighting. But there were still plenty of other issues to keep the illustrators and propagandists busy including encouraging women to sign up for the Auxiliary Territorial Service, joining the Land Army as farm workers and keeping the factories running. In the 20 years between the wars, illustration in Europe had seen more modernist abstracted styles become popular, and quite a few illustrators were now creating images which harnessed dynamic graphic clarity rather than painterly skill. Abram Games was one of these stylists and the posters he designed throughout the war and in his subsequent career were clearly influenced by French Art Deco posterist A.M. Cassandra. There was also the lesser known but equally prevalent Pat Keeley who shared the same geometric non-representational influences and applied them to his wartime contributions. A large volume of British propaganda was devoted to the idea that enemy spies were apparently everywhere. Although the truth of this was debatable, many comic and serious images warning of the consequences of indiscretion were created. The humorous work of Cyril Bird, better known as Fugas, was seen on posters everywhere in Britain, and this comic campaign has proven to be enduringly iconic. The success or otherwise of these cheerfully absurd doodles is impossible to assess, but either way they made Fugas's reputation as a cartoonist. Fellow humorist H.M. Bateman was already popular as a master of social observation and embarrassment, and he used this talent to persuade civilians to conserve energy which would be better used by the military, another prevalent theme in this war's propaganda. But as in the first war, it was down to the political cartoonists in newspapers and magazines to point out the moral shortcomings of the enemy. Punch's Bernard Partridge was still professionally active and was even more vigorous in his graphic denouncement of Hitler. And he kept up his comic condemnation of the Nazis and their allies without mercy until the war ended. Where Partridge was still very much of the Victorian crosshatch tradition, the younger cartoonist David Lowe displayed a far more contemporary gestural style. Lowe had been warning everyone against Hitler's rise and the policy of appeasement ever since the early 1930s, and like Partridge, he continued with his mission relentlessly throughout the conflict with some of the bleakest, most eloquent visual humour ever seen. The United States had stayed out of the war in Europe, but joined the Allied forces when the Japanese bombed their naval base at Pearl Harbor in 1941. Consequently, their propaganda was directed toward the enemy in the East as much as it was at the Germans. And as in the first war, many of the posters created for their campaigns made use of the representational skills of their best painters. Relative newcomers such as Albert Dawn created some dramatic emotionally charged images, warning of the consequence of careless talk. And the remarkably controlled brushwork of John Falter was used on many posters for the same purpose aimed at troops and civilians alike. And their work appeared alongside contributions from the old guard, such as the still professionally active N.C. Wyeth and Mead Schaefer, whose rousing patriotic images appeared on posters and in magazines. There was an even greater demand for cartoon-style propaganda, 
some of which was good-natured and some of which was not. Jack Campbell had been an animator with Disney Studios, but during the war he was the creator of the highly rendered cartoon bad guy Tokyo Kid, a particularly hostile representation of Japan's evil intentions who featured on posters in American factories. And being Jewish, Polish-born Arthur Sizik was naturally merciless in his mockery of Hitler, but also made sure Mussolini and Hirohito got their fair share of abuse in the lavishly detailed paintings he created for magazines such as Collier's. And Russian-born emigre Boris Artsibashev wasn't far behind him, producing strangely compelling compositions which highlighted the evil forces of fascism threatening the planet. At the start of the war, Theodore Geisel, better known as Dr. Seuss, had just had his first children's book published. But that aspect of his career got put on hold while he devoted himself to taking comic pot shots at the enemy. And although his cartoons seemed superficially cheerful, his loose expressive line work and bitter humour frequently equaled that of Britain's David Lowe. But there was lighter humour too. Creator of the seminal strip The Spirit, Will Eisner created a popular campaign aimed at military transport workers using the idiot character Joe Dope as a warning against sloppy workmanship. And while in active service, Bill Malden simultaneously drew gags similar to those of British cartoonist Bruce Byrne's father in World War I but with battle-weary GIs making the best of things while being shot at overseas. The Japanese themselves had very little need of propaganda to boost morale. Their ancient codes of honour and the perceived sacred nature of their struggle was more than enough motivation. Even so, they did produce some poster material and most of it displayed the strong design aesthetic they had developed a reputation for in peacetime. The same could not be said of the particularly badly drawn leaflets which were dropped on Allied troops fighting in the East, which attempted a rather simplistic and ultimately ineffective divide and conquer strategy. It was inevitable that in this war the Italians would eagerly line up with the Germans. Just like Hitler, Benito Mussolini was a fascist dictator who had risen to absolute power through any means necessary during the 20s and 30s, and they shared many of the same belligerent objectives. Other than a small number of more blockish modernist examples, the Italian illustrators continued to favour highly rendered painted posters, which used melodramatic emotive imagery to make their point. Their campaign was led by the remarkable illustrative talent of Gino Boccasile, he was already established as Italy's most popular illustrator, with a lot of successful commercial poster work to his credit, and he had been appointed Italy's head of propaganda as war had loomed ever closer in the mid-thirties. Boccasile created a remarkably stylish and relentless poster campaign, which early on settled for patriotically Italian pro-fascist sentiments. But as Mussolini's grip on Italy started to weaken, Boccasile's imagery became increasingly venomous, racist and anti-Semitic, right up to Italy's surrender and Mussolini's assassination in 1943. Boccasile was later tried as a member of the Italian SS, but was acquitted of war crimes. In the years following the Great War, French illustration had been particularly seduced by the primary influences of Cubism and Art Deco, and many of their illustrators applied these modernist principles to their work, generally urging resistance to the German invaders. A.M. Cassandra was too busy actually fighting, but others, such as posterist Paul Collin, who was too old to fight, supplied their services with stylistically similar work. But because a lot of France was under German occupation, there was considerably less printed propaganda than previously, and magazines such as Luria had been well and truly silenced. The Russians had their own murderous dictator in the form of Joseph Stalin, 
Before the war, he had signed a non-aggression pact with Hitler, but in 1941 the Germans invaded Russia anyway, so Stalin quickly joined the Allies as a matter of self-preservation. From that point on, Russia's propaganda portrayed the war rather dishonestly as an ideological struggle between fascism and communism. Given their own appalling track record, they could hardly claim to be fighting anti-Semitism. And in the main, they continue with the blockish, dynamic graphic style they had popularised following the revolution. Although there were some less predictable European-style deviations too, and even occasional uncharacteristic humour. As for Germany itself, Hitler's Minister of Propaganda, Joseph Goebbels, redoubled his efforts to keep German resolve and belief in their holy mission as fervent as possible, with all manner of propaganda, including an avalanche of patriotic posters. Once again, Ludwig Holwein led the way, and had done throughout the rise of the Nazi party in the 30s. All of his work continued to harness his trademark dynamism and powerful aesthetic sensibility to make the Aryan ideology of the Third Reich look like a seductively heroic and noble cause. And faith in the Fuhrer himself was another prevailing theme in German propaganda, with many images by Holwein and others showing the Fuhrer as a benign heroic figure Germans should be proud to serve. Holwein never produced any directly anti-Semitic imagery, but there were plenty of lesser talents only too happy to oblige. And many images were produced under Goebbels' direction, which depicted Jews as not only a blight on Germany, but also as the evil puppet masters pulling the strings of the Allied forces. And in the countries they had occupied, the Germans invariably set about trying to convince the inhabitants that it was actually a good thing. These examples are Norwegian, and they were all created by the popular illustrator Harold Damsleth, who was himself a fascist and only too happy to oblige his new masters with a string of pro-German painted posters. As for German humour, the artists of Simplicissimus once again rallied to the call, even if some did so reluctantly. But it was a matter of self-preservation, and it seemed preferable to death in a concentration camp. Artists such as Olaf Gulbranson repeated their performance from the Great War and created images vilifying the Allies in general and Winston Churchill in particular. Germany's other leading satirical magazine, Lustiger Blatter, was considerably more overtly anti-Semitic and many of its covers and pages were devoted to accomplished and stylish but morally inexcusable cartoons attacking the Jews and the Allies with increasing vitriol as the war progressed. But it was obvious to even the staunchest of Nazis that the Third Reich was rapidly being overwhelmed. Italy had already surrendered and in 1945 the German war machine collapsed and peace was restored in Europe. Some months later, following the atomic bombing of Nagasaki and Hiroshima, the Japanese too stopped fighting. Estimates vary, but more than 50 million people died in this war. Mussolini was already dead, Hitler and Goebbels committed suicide, and others were executed for war crimes. Being royal, Hirohito got away with his life. And ever since, we have lived under the ever-present shadow of a third world war. Who knows, maybe we'll get lucky and we'll continue to dodge that bullet. But if it does come, we'll have little need of propaganda. <laughs>